Interesting that the president appears to uh, us in Australia to have been claiming, well, this was Trump's policy, I had to follow through. That sounded very hollow to us because one of the other things that's received a great deal of attention was the rapidity with which he overturned everything that he didn't like that Trump had done. It sounded very hollow to say, I'm just continuing what Trump set up. That's exactly right. Uh, he canceled the border wall. He, we had no illegal aliens essentially coming across the border. He stopped that. We were, the, we were pumping three million more barrels of oil. We were the largest oil producer, natural gas producer in the world. He stopped the Anwar. He stopped federal, the Anwar um, oil field in Alaska. He stopped the Keystone Pipeline. He told frackers that their days were numbered. He stopped all new federal leases of fossil fuels. So yeah, I mean, he, he, he was quite willing and able and happy to suspend all of the Trump initiatives. He's going to do another one with this massive tax increase. But so that was just, that was just uh, a pretense. The fact of the matter was, is the Trump plan at some point would require Joe Biden to use force against the Taliban. Now, the reason it didn't require Donald Trump to do it, because he killed al-Baghdadi, he killed Soleimani, he would bombed the crap out of ISIS, he had warned Iran he was going to respond, and he had created deterrence. And they knew that if they did that, he would he dropped the mother of all bombs on them a few years ago. But they didn't know whether Joe Biden would do that. They had suspicions that he would not, and he confirmed them. And so they accelerated their aggression the more that he did not retaliate to it. It does uh, look very chaotic, I have to say, the more you look at it, uh, whether, as you say, it was 80% of what's been spent on helping the state of Israel or however much it is, it now appears that uh, the Taliban have control of more Black Hawk helicopters than most countries have in their entire air forces, including Australia. Um, it looks uh, as though there's some 350,000 assault weapons that have been left behind. It seems that the missile capacity, 600,000. 75,000 vehicles. These are $5 million MRAPs. They're armed Humvees. They're armed vehicles. Far more than your country has in its military. So a lot of people said, if you were going to pull out, and you had no confidence anyway, then why not just evacuate these weapons to our allies and give it to them if we're, you know, in that part of the world or, and it would make, so a lot of the anger is that we are harder on our allies than we are on our enemies. Or as to rephrase, you know, the, the dictator Sully said, he used to say Rome, his, Rome under Sulla was no better friend, no worse enemy, where there's no worse friend and no better enemy than the United States in the views of our enemies. And so now they have hostages, they have planes full of our friends and some Americans on the tarmac and they're not releasing them. So if we, if Joe Biden thought that by giving him anywhere from 75 to 85 billion to the Taliban, that that was going to satiate them and then they wouldn't ask for more, it just made them more uh, hungry for bribes. And so I think for the next few years, we're going to have a bold Bergdahl situation, which we're humiliated. An American pops up in Kandahar, an American pops up in, on the border with Pakistan, and then we're told on a video that he wants to be released, and there's going to be so many billions, so many concessions. And this is going to go on and on until we have somebody that says, stop it or that we retaliate. We're gonna to have to do something at some at time to restore deterrence or our allies will have to make the necessary adjustments. And already, as you know well, far better than I do, there are people in Taiwan, in South Korea, in Japan, in the Philippines, and I do assume that in Australia together as well, who are saying, you know what? We're right on the cusp of Chinese military power and they make no, they're not subtle about the, their use of it. And they come to us and they say to us all the time, we're the next economic juggernaut. We're on the rise, the United States is on decline. They're very dangerous people because of their radically unpredictable popular culture. They go back on their word. They'll never protect you. If you wanna do business with us, then join us. Then and we're gonna be pretty much uh, not very critical of your own government. We just care about business and you have to be on our side and and provide fealty toward us and keep your mouth shut about our internal affairs. That's their message. 
So if we can't say to our friends that are democracies and constitutional republics, we're here for you and we have far more military power than China does and we're going to use it to protect you and we're your partners, then, then we're nothing. We're nothing. We're, there's nothing left of the Western alliance. NATO ceases to exist. So ironic that the president who was on Couth and Crass and we were told by the adults in the room had unfairly jawboned NATO, succeeded in getting them to invest a hundred million dollars more in their defense budget and up the readiness of NATO powers as much as they didn't like to do that. And the person who said that he was going to reach out to NATO is all for now destroyed the alliance by humiliating it and leaving it vulnerable in a country that would that the United States asked it to join in with. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.